Hey, and welcome back to the Fantasy Football Profits. Guys, thank you so much for being here for our running back rankings part two. Or I guess maybe a better word would be our deep running back rankings because we're going to go, last time we went from 1 to 20, this time we're going to go from running back number 21 all the way to 50. So that's going to be a lot of fun, guys. Of course, as always, there will be time stamps in the description so you can hop around and you can see all the rankings really quick and easy. But before that, we have some huge news to announce. If you're a subscriber and you've been watching a lot of our videos, you probably heard us mention that it was coming up, it was about to happen, but we just recently updated our website. It got a major revamp and I think it's much improved. So for those of you guys who don't have Instagram, you can go on and check out our Instagram posts on our website. We also have our videos on there. Uh, and of course, importantly, our rankings. But the other thing we have to mention, and I talked about this recently, was our Patreon is now released. That is really great, guys. We have premium stats for you guys. There will be a link in the description. If you want to check that out, you can go subscribe to us on Patreon for $5 a month and get premium stats that you really just can't find anywhere else, all sorts of in-depth stuff. If you guys have any questions about that, make sure to drop a comment down below. Um, I think that really all I have to say about that. Let's get into this video. Let's get into these rankings and get into our first guy that we have to talk about. All right, so last video we ended in tier three, and we're going to pick up where we left off in tier three with Sony Michelle. Now, Sony Michelle had a pretty darn good rookie season. He ran for 931 yards and six touchdowns in just 13 games, and he did on a solid 4.5 yards per carry. That right there is a solid, solid stat line. You can't argue with that, and I think a lot of people were really surprised. Not only was he a rookie coming into this Patriots offense that's really historically known for being this running back by committee system where no guys can. And thrive and he thrived he did it in just 13 games if he had played a full season he would have been over a thousand yards in fact he was actually on pace for 15 or excuse me for 1150 rushing yards that would have been sixth best in the nfl last year had he played a whole year so that's very impressive um not only that but a lot of guys get in coach belichick's doghouse right you get injured you miss a couple of games that's usually it for your role as a starting running back or your guy as sort of this workhorse back out of the backfield but that wasn't it for michelle they really understood his situation he was fighting hard to come back from that injury and he was performing well when he was on the field uh, he's not an absolute monster i think there's a bit of a ceiling there because of james white we're going to talk about james white a little bit later on in this video uh, but the numbers are there, especially in standard leagues. However, he's not terrible in PPR leagues. In five different games last year in PPR scoring, he scored at least 17 fantasy points. So that right there is pretty good. Shows even in a PPR league, he can be a valuable option. What I like about this guy most, and I got to mention it, this guy is just the model of consistency. Let me read off some stats for you. He was top 20 in elusive rating, breakaway percentage, yards per carry, touchdown, yards after contact, and avoided tackles. As well as he was top 15 in yards, carries of 10 plus yards, and first downs. The numbers were there. But what I like most about it was his progression as the season went on. In fact, he really thrived and really stood out and showed us what kind of back he can be when the playoffs came around. In three playoff games, he had 71 carries for 336 yards. By the way, that is a solid 4.7 yards per carry and six touchdowns. Guys, that is two touchdowns a game average over three games in the playoffs. That's insane. That's against much better defenses than you're typically facing in the regular season. Now, the last thing to note is the injury, right? Right now, he is actually not practicing. However, oh, that's not much of a concern. Let me read some, some research, kind of some stuff that I found on him. So one thing to note is that the Patriots have plenty of time to take Sony Michelle off the injury list and get him into practice. They have to do it before first cuts are made. Otherwise, he'll be required to miss six games. However, Patriots coaching staff have come out and said he is easily going to be practicing and with the team before that happens. Um, again, currently he's on the pup list, but they said he's going to be back. I think they're just resting him because they like this guy so much. So that is just something to know if the injury is not a major concern. I think the Patriots are very, very smart with what they do, and they just want to keep this guy healthy for the whole season because they saw what he did in the playoffs last year. If he can be that same running back this season, not only is he going to have huge fantasy value, but he's going to be huge to the Patriots organization as a whole. So I think they're just playing it safe, playing it cautious. But Everything seems good right now. The numbers are there. The stats are there. That's what I got to say about Sony Michelle. I like this guy. 
So for me at number 22, I got David Montgomery running back for Chicago Bears. Uh, this guy really is a complete package. He's a three down back, or at least he can be. And I think he landed in almost the perfect spot. I think half the battles for a rookie is to get on a roster where there's no veterans in front of you that are a lock. And right now I hit him on the depth chart. The only one that you really have in there that's going to be competition will be Mike Davis. And he'll offer a little bit of challenge. But uh, Mike Davis is far from an all pro that's been proven there. Uh, Montgomery could really explode in this offense. It's an improving young offense with Coach Nagy, who brought the Bears from 29th in scoring in 2017 to last year ninth. That's a 20 spot permit. That's huge. I think they're going to continue to improve as an offense. Um, love the guy's size, 5'10", 222. So he's a prototypical NFL back as far as his build goes and what he can do there. He's got great elusiveness and balance. And, and you know, one thing for me that's real important. <clears throat> Everything you hear about this guy sounds like he's got character, and to me that matters so much. He's known to be a, a great stand-up guy, hard worker, mature person, very productive. I love that, especially when you're new in the league there. Coach Nagy came on and talked about this guy's ability to break tackles, how important that is. He said that the amount of tackles that he can make defenders miss inside the tackle box, he learns how to extend runs with sheer power. He has tremendous ability to feel when the next guy is coming. His peripheral vision is excellent. A lot of positive things to say about this guy there. General Manager Pace said that Dave Montgomery breaks a lot of tackles. He said there are guys that are bouncing off him left and right. Now he goes on to say that a lot of times when running backs will break tackles, they can break a tackle. That's not hard to do, but they're off balance. But he says he has the ability to break tackles and yet remain, um, keep forward momentum, keep positive yards there. So he's got great balance there. And uh, so now he's got the ability to break a lot of tackles, but he could be a better of, um, he could be actually behind one of the better offensive lines now that the team has returned Cody Whithair and James Daniels back to their natural positions. They tried it last year, it didn't work out. They moved back to guard and center. I think that's going to help along with Mitch Trubinsky's continued development. I think it'll open up a lot of holes for those running backs there. Last year, really, the only thing that was missing from Chicago's offense was a true three down back. You need a back like that in Coach Nagy's system that can keep defenses honest. You know, you had Jordan Howard, great north-south runner, very physical, but just can't, uh, it's not very effective in the passing game. They had Tree Cohen, who's a great pass-catching back, but he's really too small to be an every-down back. Montgomery can bring all that. He can be a three-down back, undoubtedly. He's playing for an offense that's improving, an innovative offense with an offensive-minded coach, and they're committed to running the ball. Pro Football Focus to their final running back rankings, um, after the draft, and they had him ranked number two behind Josh Jacobs. We talked about him in the last video. I think he's number 18 in our rankings. Uh, he's in a great position, probably the best of any rookies, but number two, I think, is David Montgomery. I think this team, if you look at what they're going to try to do, the strength of this team is defense, so they're going to grind it out, control the clock, run the ball. I think it's important. The only concern I have for him is Mike Davis. Uh, Mike Davis proved to be a solid back, and Mike Davis um, is actually very good in pass protection. And that's so important when rookies come in the league, they've got to understand pass protection. So I would say this, um, Montgomery's progress in pass protection could hinder snaps early in the year. We're going to watch that. We're going to monitor that, see if he's picking that up well. Um, but right now, everything seems lined up for him to have a big season uh, as a rookie running back, which we have seen that rookie running backs tend to come in the NFL and they can succeed right away. Absolutely. One more thing to tack on to really what you said, which I completely agree with. It's just you're getting this guy right here at 22, but especially in a dynasty or a keeper league, that value skyrockets. And this guy has a lot of potential. He could easily find himself in the top 20. But again, we put him here simply because of Mike Davis and some other concerns. But I love that pick there. All right, so here we are at 23. We got to put Kenyon Drake here. There's a lot to like about this guy. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty and I think apprehension, uh, but things are looking up for him. And I really think, I really believe that. I think some people were hyped about him last year, picked him, and it didn't quite work out. And they feel like they got burned and they want to stay away from him. Yeah, maybe stay away from him as he's not going to be a top 15 back, but he definitely belongs in this spot. Let's talk about some of the reasons why. For starters, in 2018, he had 120 carries for 535 yards and four rushing touchdowns. That's pretty good. That's not great, but really the problem there wasn't his production. The problem was the Dolphins were refusing to commit to him in the running game. For whatever reason, they liked Frank Gore more and they ran the ball with him. So that's my first reason that things are looking up for Kenyon Drake is that Frank Gore is gone. Frank Gore had over 700 rushing yards last year. That is a lot of ground game to cover and it's gonna be Kenyon Drake's ball this year. I think that right there benefits him quite a bit. So I like that a lot. The other thing that I like, no offense to Coach Adam Gase, but it's really good for him that he's gone. For whatever reason, Coach Gase refused to commit to Kenyon Drake in the running game. He had a lot of issues with that offense. To be honest, I don't think that he is cut out to be an NFL head coach. 
That's just what I believe. You've seen what he did with that team. It just wasn't working out. I think they actually got an upgrade at quarterback, which I think benefits them in Ryan Fitzpatrick. However, I will state that I don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is great. You'd love to have a better quarterback situation to help your running back, but it's still an improvement from what they had last year. Uh, one thing to note, a lot of people don't know this. This is why you've got to take the time to look at the in-depth stats that a lot of people aren't willing to. And this is kind of the reason we're offering these premium stat packages so you can look at these numbers yourself. Uh, but a lot of people don't know Drake finished sixth in fantasy points per touch. He scored 1.2 fantasy points per touch in 2018. Of course, that is among qualifying running backs, just to clarify. But that's huge. I mean, if he could do that again and then get as many touches as some of these other running backs, he could have a huge season. Of course, I don't quite think he's going to finish sixth again in fantasy points per touch if his volume goes up. But if his volume goes up, that itself bodes out well for him. Uh, and then finally, I will think one thing that people really need to understand is how great it's going to be this season. He's got an improved quarterback who's going to be able to take advantage of what he's able to do in the passing game. Get this, a lot of people don't know, last year he had 53 receptions. That was 53 catches for 447 receiving yards and five receiving touchdowns. There aren't many running backs in the NFL who receive more touchdowns than they rush for. Kenyon Drake was one of them last year. Why? Because when you give him a screen or you give him a little catch out of the backfield, he can do more with it and he doesn't have to have his poor offensive line as a detriment to him. He can get out in the open field and let his talent and his physicality and his skills carry him into the end zone and so that's one of the reasons that that happened and I think it's going to help him a lot this year to have an improved quarterback lastly he finished fourth among running backs in receiving touchdowns and seventh among running backs in passer rating generated this is one of the best receiving running backs uh, I say maybe one of the most underrated receiving running backs in the NFL Ken and Drake a pretty good option this year things are looking up for him for sure so James White, you look at James White, he's always been a nice weapon for the Patriots. He's shown good hands, runs good routes, he creates matchup problems for linebackers. But in 2018, he took it to the next level. Last year, he had 87 catches, 751 yards, and 7 TDs. That was excellent, right? But his catch rate per game, how many catches he has per game on average has gone up from the very year. His rookie season, he had 1.67 catches per game. He went to 2.86, 3.75 to 4, and then last year, a huge 5.44 catches per game was awesome. But here's the thing. I think he could actually improve that number this year, and here's why, um, other than the obvious. Obviously, the, we know that he's a go-to guy that Brady trusts. In fact, we saw that in the playoffs. He had one game in the postseason, 15 catches for 97 yards. Obviously, very much trust this guy. But here's why I think those numbers could go up again this year. The departures of Gronkowski and Gordon. Now, Gordon, in theory, could be back this year, but everything points to the fact he's probably not gonna be back. Those are huge weapons that are gone out of that offense. Somebody has to pick up those targets, and I think he could be that guy. You look at through the first nine games last year, he was really crushing it. And then um, he had kind of a statistical fall off a little bit after nine games. Some of that could add to the fact or could be contributed to the fact that Edelman came back and Gordon got more involved in that offense there. Last season in PPR leagues, he finished eighth in total scoring. But nobody in the league was more productive in their touches than he was. He led all running backs and points per touch. He was phenomenal there. You talked about Kenyon Drake being number six. Well, number one was James White. Excellent in that area. I think another thing that bodes well for me is uh, Sonny Michelle. I like Sonny Michelle quite a bit, but you talked about his knee issues. Mm -hmm. So with those knee issues that are questionable there, I think it bodes well for White that every year in the league, he's increased his carries. And then last year when he had his most carries ever in his career, had a career best yards per carry of 4.5. That's really good there. I think that could even go up again. At 27 years old, he's got many good years ahead of him. I think he holds higher value in PPR leagues versus standards. I think that's kind of obvious. But in PPR leagues, this guy's a very, very solid, um, I would say a high-end running back to very high-end, right on the border of running back one for PPR leagues, lower standard, obviously. Yeah, you know, one thing that I like to throw in there just to help a little bit is I think some clarification. A lot of people are probably wondering, how can we have these guys ranked so similar, so similarly? One, I want to say, is that they're both ranked outside of the top 20. So we're not saying they're both going to be elite fantasy options. The other thing being that there are situations in the NFL where two backs have great seasons. You know one of those situations was? Like the Saints with Mark Ingram and with Alvin Kamara. But another one was just last year with these two guys, James White and Sony Michelle, who both had good years. Michelle was on pace for a thousand rushing yards. James White had this insane year in the passing game. And so I think that we don't have to count them out of being able to do that again. In fact, it only makes sense. Sorry, Rob, I'll let you get back to it. No, I think that's it. Uh, I love James White at number 24 there, so.
All right, so here we are, guys. Tier four running backs is going to be our running backs number 25 through 38. These are the guys that we just don't trust their ability to keep the starting role throughout the entire season, right? These guys might have a lot of talents. In fact, our next guy has some insane stats that you guys are going to like, but there's just a bit of a concern there as far as whether or not they can get the touches they need to get and whether or not they're going to hold on to that position. So that's basically what this tier four is. Um, and of course, some of the guys at the top are a little bit more talented, some of the guys at the bottom, but we're going to talk about them. Let's move on. Let's not waste any time. All right, so here we are. I think we got to talk about Chris Carson. I'm going to put this out there right now. You will not find a running back outside of the top 15 with a stat line as impressive as Chris Carson's. You just won't. It's pretty much a fact at this point. He's absolutely had an insane last year, insane year last year. Excuse me. He finished 15th in PPR scoring and 14th in standard league scoring. That alone is huge. That right there says, all right, we need to consider him pretty highly. Of course, we'll talk about some concerns later, but you look at the stats, stat after stat. At, he finished super high. He had some great numbers. He finished seventh in carries. He finished fifth in rushing yards, 11th in yards per carry, ninth in rushing touchdowns, third in first down carries, fifth in yards after contact, third in average yard after contact, and tied for first with avoided tackles. I, I just, he had an insane year last year. He was, he was a monster. This guy's crazy. He finished in the top five for rushing yards alone. He finished up there in touchdowns. He had nine rushing touchdowns, over 1,100 yards. Got to like the stat line. He had a huge year last year. Like I said, you're not going to find a guy outside of the top 15 with numbers like that. What are the concerns? Well, I think really in the end, this is a pretty short conversation, guys. The concern is Rashad Penny. And Rashad Penny is almost equally as a talented a running back. And it's one of those things where if Penny comes out and steps it up, this could be a running back by committee system. Penny could even take the role. Let's look at some stats that Rashad Penny had last year. So he ran for 419 yards on 85 carries. Guys, that's 4.9 yards per carry. That's through the roof. That is a seriously great number. But he also caught 9 of 12 targets for 75 yards. Um, here's the thing, guys. I expect this year that towards the end of the season, Penny is going to start making the majority of the carries and is going to be able to have a huge role in that offense because he showed himself to not only be a really good runner with a high yards per carry, really efficient guy, but he's also getting it done the passing game with a 75% catch percentage. Uh, that right there kind of scares me a little bit. The numbers for Chris Carson were great, but you do have to ask yourself, is that Seattle coaching staff going to roll with Carson all year long? Probably not quite. And one of the last things you want to have is a guy who you ranked in the top 15 as one of your starting running backs. All of a sudden, playoff time comes, and he starts to lose carries to the younger running back in Rashad Penny, who is probably the future running back of that offense as we go forward a few years from now. However, his year was too big last year, and he's still kind of set to be the number one guy to start this season. So he comes in here at this number 25 spot and leads off our tier four. Jordan Howard. So um, you look at the first two seasons that he was in the league. This guy thrived. He did struggle last season. You can't avoid that. Uh, many people agreed and talked about it before the season. We said it on our site. He just wasn't a good fit for Nagy's offense. So I think that uh, a lot of people went in and knew that he was going to struggle and he did. Before he took that step back last year, he recorded in his first two seasons, 2,435 rushing yards. That's excellent. And he had 15 touchdowns in those two seasons. When you look at those rushing yards in those two seasons, right, that made he was third behind Ezekiel Elliott and Le'Veon Bell for rushing yards in those two years. He was phenomenal there. Um, those numbers are even more impressive when you consider the fact that they weren't a very good offense. They were struggling. He saw many loaded boxes. In fact, if you look at how many loaded boxes he faced the first two years when he was so successful, 2017, he was second behind Leonard Fournette. He faced eight men boxes 43% of the time. It's amazing this guy had 1,000-yard seasons. Honestly, he was phenomenal there. In his rookie season in 2016, when he was a rookie there, um, no other rookie forced more missed tackles than he did. And last year, in the last five games, he kind of reminded us what he's capable of doing. The last five regular season games, he went out and he had four touchdowns, 399 rushing yards, at a yards per carry of 4.53. So I think he shows he's still got it there. He's only missed one game in the NFL, uh, and it wasn't due to injury as a rookie. So this guy's been very durable. If you look back all the way to college, um, he's been healthy. He's big. He's physical at six foot, 224. His body can handle the wear and tear of taking 20 to 25 carries a game. If there's a downside to him, uh, he's deficient in the passing game. That's why he was moved on there. It's why he didn't excel in Nagy's um, scheme there. But I think for this guy, I think easily 250 uh, carries for 1,000 yards is attainable for him. Mm -hmm. 
the Phillies traded for this guy. They brought him in here because they're looking for somebody to be kind of that bell cow, a guy that Jay Ajayi couldn't be for them when he went down with an injury and all their backups that played there just didn't uh, get it done there. So he's a guy that's got a higher, I would say, um, definitely higher in standard leagues, much lower in PPR leagues, but I like Jordan Howard here at number 26. All right, here at this next spot, we got to talk about Philip Lindsay. This guy came on the scene out of nowhere, seemingly, and really shocked us to be a very talented running back and a very good fantasy option. He had 192 carries last year. Of course, he took that for over 1,000 yards and an extremely impressive 5.4 yards per carry. I believe that was best in the NFL. That's insane. That's through the roof. He also had nine rushing touchdowns. Those numbers are great. I mean, those are seriously great numbers. But how's he going to do this year? Let's not talk so much about last year. Are we going to be able to project this year how well is he going to do? Well, I think one of the biggest concerns, and people have mentioned this, people have really been on both sides of the fence and debated this back and forth since he came onto the league and since he started to show himself, was that is he undersized and is that going to be a problem? Personally, I vote yes. I think it's a minor problem. I don't think it's a major problem, but I definitely think it is. Get this. Last year, he had 35 receptions for 241 yards and one touchdown. That right there hardly makes him a PPR stud. That is maybe average at best in the receptions category and below average in yards and touchdowns. For whatever reason, it's probably just due to the quarterback situation, he wasn't getting it done in the air. And that was a major problem. For a guy who's undersized like that, this becomes a serious issue. When we look back at all the different running backs who have been undersized but had good careers, Jamal Charles, Darren Sproles, you name it, those guys did stuff in the passing game. For Philip Lindsay to keep his value to get in the top 20 and to do what he did last year fantasy value wise, he needs to do more in the passing game because a smaller frame like that cannot take quite the beating that he was taking last year. Injuries are going to start to pile up and his yards per carry is going to start to drop. I know that's an unpopular opinion and I'd love to discuss that in the comments below. So if you disagree with me, tell me how much you hate me and how much you think I'm wrong in the comments and we'll talk about it more. I don't want to waste too much time on it. Um, but that's really how I feel about that. However, there's some more good news about him. I want to talk positive. I don't just want to kind of trash on the guy a little bit because he does come in this spot for a reason. He finished fifth in fantasy points per snap with 0.41 fantasy points per snap that he was on the field out there. And in the last 10 games, he had 15 or more touches every single game. However, he was a guy who didn't get huge volume. 15 touches is very mediocre. It's solid. It's okay. But if you want to become a workhorse back and get to that next level, we'd like to see 20 or more touches a game. And he did not do that many times last season. I think he only did it twice all year last year. And so I think he's a guy who finds himself very talented, a great piece of that Broncos offense, but just limited uh, in his ability to work in the passing game. It's not a great offense with that quarterback situation offensive line. And his undersizedness means he's probably not going to have a whole lot of carries throughout the year. So he just finds himself with a ceiling. That's pretty much why we put him here. He's just a guy with a ceiling. So number 28, we've got Mark Ingram. Alvin Kamara made him dispensable. And when teams are cash strapped nowadays, they're trying to save money. One thing that they found is that it, the one position where you could probably cut corners is a running back. They're not going to spend a lot of money on guys like this, especially for a veteran guy that's getting a little bit older as far as running backs go. With that said, Mark Ingram has been very good in his career. Uh, he landed Baltimore who's really committed to running the ball. If you look at week 11 through week 17 last year, when Lamar Jackson took over as starting quarterback and they really focused on that conservative offense, ran the ball a lot, they averaged 229 rushing yards per game. They're going to continue to do that, obviously, uh, to protect Lamar Jackson and his development. If you look at Ingram, since year two, his yards per carry have been good. He's got good hands. He's a solid vet. He's going to add stability to that offense with a young quarterback who's going to need that there. Well, I will say this with Mark Ingram, though. He's got a lower ceiling. A couple of reasons why. One, that offense is not prolific. They're not going to score a lot of points. And two, there's a lot of mouths to feed there. you got Gus Edwards who had a pretty good year. Dixon, Lamar Jackson, still some goal line carries there. So that lowers his ceiling there. Now, he may lose some carries and he may lose some touches around the, uh, the goal line there. But I think he's going to make that up in targets. The Ravens are, are they're dealing with a young quarterback who's uh, really still learning and, and at times looked overmatched last year, undoubtedly. And so uh, even this year, they talked about how Lamar Jackson's already struggling in preseason there or in camp, I should say. And so I think they're going to run a conservative offense, and they're going to do a lot of shorter throws, dump downs to running backs. I think Mark Ingram will easily break 50 uh, catches like he averaged for the Saints between 2015 and 2017 there. As far as O-line goes, uh, that's so important. Like, I don't care how talented a running back you are. If your offensive line is not very good, it doesn't really matter. But if you look at uh, the Baltimore Ravens running uh, 
I should say, offensive line. They're top third in the league. Um, they finished the very solid, what we call adjusted line yards. They were ninth in the NFL in adjusted line yards. In our previous video, we talked about what that was. If you want to know, go back, watch the video. We explain what that means and how that applies there. So I look at Mark Ingram. I think he's a solid low-end running back two, a high-end running back three. He's got a safe floor but a lower ceiling. Anything you want to add to that? No, I completely agree with you. You talked about it recently. Um, I don't think it was on camera. I don't think we filmed a bit. But we were just talking about really running back drafting philosophy. Of course, we think running backs early and often. So you get those two. You try to get two elite guys. Uh, and then boom, where do you go from there once you've got your starting running backs? And, and you were saying, and I completely agree with it, your number three guy is probably a safe option, a guy like a Mark Ingram. He might not have the highest ceiling in the world, but you've got your fallback for bye weeks, for injuries, if something happens. And then after that, your running backs four, five, six, seven, whatever, those are the guys that you're kind of gambling on, you're taking risks on. They're more rookies, they're more sleepers, dark horses, whatever you want to call them. Mark Ingram seems to be in that sort of category where you're going to take him as your running back three, and you're going to feel safe that you've got a secure option there in case something happens to one of your studs. Isn't that right? Does that sound about right? I would agree with you there. All right, here we got Lamar Miller. This is a guy who I don't think people are really hyped on him, and maybe he fits in a very similar category as Mark Ingram. We just talked about him. Uh, but he's a guy who hasn't rushed for 1,000 yards since his first season in Houston. In fact, he's only done it twice in his seven-year NFL career. That looks pretty bad, uh, but it's not all bad news. Since 2014, Miller has finished anywhere from 10th to 16th every single time in NFL rushing. He's a guy who over that span has averaged uh, 981 rushing yards with 35 catches and 270 receiving yards plus seven total touchdowns. That doesn't sound amazing. However, that does equate to 202 PPR fantasy points, which would have slotted him as the number 17 fantasy running back in 2018. That right there sounds pretty good to me. Uh, but I think there's, of course, always a little bit more to consider with this. He is aging a little bit. He's in an offense that doesn't focus on the run quite as much as we'd like. There's a bit of offensive line struggles. Um, however, I guess there is, I guess, sort of one more piece of good news. And that's really that he started slow, but the second half of 2018 had all of his touchdowns and all of his 100 yard games came after week six. He really picked it up that second half. He played that first five games and he struggled and things did not look good. And that was not just his fault. That was Deshaun Watson's fault, Hopkins' fault, the offensive line's fault, the coaching staff's fault. The entire offense struggled. And when some of those other pieces started to figure themselves out, Miller really went out and was the guy who was able to figure some things out. And he had a great season. And so... It's really nice to see that he really stepped it up the second half of the year. I don't think he's an amazing pick. I certainly do think he has a ceiling, but I also know pretty much seemingly, it seems like a fact right now, he's going to be the number one running back this year. I mean, this is a guy who has the job. We can talk about Dante Foreman later on. Um, however, I don't think that he's going to be a guy with who's really going to come in and take this job. There's not much to say about him. He's a pretty boring pick. If you want to be a smart fantasy player, I think a lot of your people in your leagues are going to wait too long to take him. You can maybe capitalize on that. I know a lot of people, they just get way too excited about these younger backs or about these guys with higher potential. This is a guy who fits right in with Mark Ingram. He's a safe pick and he's a guy who's got the job. I don't think you can ask for much more than that. So number 30, we've got LaShawn McCoy. I'm going to play a little bit off of what you said a second ago. Uh, this is not an exciting pick by any means. But don't underestimate his value. You know the old saying, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. There are many backs in the league that might have more potential but are lacking opportunity. And you know what? I don't care how talented you are. you got to get on the field. And as of right now, he has no legitimate competition. You know, the coaches come out and give the proverbial, it's anyone's game to win, it's anybody's job. But right now, um, it's his job to lose. In fact, they asked the coach recently, Sean McDermott and general manager Billy, uh, Brandon Bean, I should say, Billy Bean, making baseball references there. Uh, Brandon Bean, they asked about his status on the team. They said, LaShawn McCoy is our number one running back as of now. In his career, this guy's been very, very good. Six times over 1,000 rushing yards, 84 career touchdowns, averaging 3.23 catches per game. But you have to wonder, at age 31, is this guy over the hill? Maybe. But the one thing that we see in the last couple of years is that players like Frank or and Adrian Peterson have shown us that you can be productive after the age of 30. These guys are having a lot of success there. Now, last year he had a bad year, right? So the question was, is because he over the hill? Is that why he had a bad year? In my opinion... When I look at everything there, I think it's more likely they had a bad year because the surrounding cast was so poor. He was in a bad situation. 
that offensive line was terrible. If you take a look at metrics, all these different metrics that we use to rate offensive lines, why they did what they did, and kind of break it down apart from running back and other things like that, the offensive line was bad. They finished 28th and 32nd all the time in the bottom of the NFL as far as the rankings go. Um, I think the offense was hurt by bad quarterback play. Josh Allen, very athletic, but 10 touchdown passes in 12 games. Didn't really scare a lot of defenses there at all. And a quarterback rating of 67. Um, the defenses simply didn't fear the weapons on that team. Their best wide receiver is Robert Foster, who was an undrafted rookie. So they're going to be better this year. That offensive line is going to improve. The weapons will get better. They brought some guys in. They got some veterans in there. They're going to make a huge upgrade. It'll be significant. It'll give them support. Remember, he's only one year removed from 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns and 59 catches. So I think he's a guy that um, is not the guy that he was five years ago, but I think he's a guy, like you said, could be a, an RB3 on your bench and get you some valuable points because of injuries or on a bye week. Um, not exciting, but a very safe pick. Boom. I think that pretty much sums it up. All right, guys, here we are at the 31st spot. We got to put Tevin Coleman here. 2018 showed us a Tevin Coleman that could be dominant and could be a great fantasy option. The question we have to ask ourselves is on a new team, a new roster, new coaching staff, are we going to get the same Tevin Coleman? Let's look at some of the stats from last year. Last year, he set career highs with 180 snaps, 167 attempts for 800 rushing yards, 486 yards after contact, and 17 avoided tackles. The numbers were there. He improved. He stepped up. He had career highs in yards. I mean, I like that. That's some good news. Another stat that he set a career high in, though, however, was his yards per carry, an average of 4.8 yards per carry. And I think this is probably the biggest piece of evidence that goes towards Tevin Coleman's case for being a good fantasy option this year. It is very rare to watch a running back get more carries and also increase his yards per carry. Typically, running backs come into the league, they have a high yards per carry off of low attempts, and so teams give them more shots, and that yards per carry drops a little bit and evens out a bit. That is not the case with Tevin Coleman. That actually increased last year. Right now, I have to consider this guy the front runner to be the lead back in San Francisco. However, I think it's one of those situations we're expecting to primarily be a running back by committee. Uh, one thing that is kind of almost embarrassing for the San Francisco roster is that Tevin Coleman is at six foot one, 210 pounds, which is slightly underweight for a running back, by the way. He is the biggest running back that they have on that roster. That right there bodes really well for him. A guy who's proven that he can go out there and rush for 1,000 yards and still keep his 4.8 yards per carry and still keep his efficiency, who also happens to be the biggest running back on the roster – Definitely seems to be, to be a guy who's going to lead this team for carries this year. That's something that I really do expect. I don't know what percentage that's going to be, but I definitely think he's going to lead the team for carries. And, and he, right, he's, he definitely doesn't disappear in the passing game. He's still a guy who can also help. In fact, he's got some really good numbers. Last year he had 30 receptions, 5 touchdowns, and a passer rating generated of 135. So he also might be the best running back in the passing game that they have on that team. To be honest, when you look at the situation, there's a lot of other talent there. Matt Breida and um, Jarek McKinnon, excuse me. Yeah, there's some talent there. But Tevin Coleman very well could be the top guy on that team. Again, the problem is it comes down to scheme and system. The talent is there. Who knows if they're going to let this guy run away with the position? I don't think so. Yeah, you've got about uh, Rehim Mostart. You also have Wilson there. You're right. they got a lot of guys there, so... So Rashad Penny at number 32, uh, former first round pick. A lot of people, I guess, would say that he had kind of a quiet year there, but I don't think it was entirely his fault. Um, he was behind Mike Davis and Chris Carson, who performed extremely well there. Um, when you look at it, when he was called upon, when he was given the opportunity, he actually played really well. He finished seventh in the NFL in yards after contact. He had excellent 4.9 yards per carry. I think it's really important to remember that he's a former first round pick. In fact, that's the first first-round pick that they have used on a running back since Carroll has been there as coach, and general manager John Schneider has been running the team there. That's only the third time in franchise history they've used a first-round pick on a running back. The other two times were Kurt Warren and Sean Alexander. So you're not going to get a, draft a guy in the first round and have him sit on your bench. They've got plans for this guy, and I think that eventually he's going to become the franchise running back there. At 5'11", 220, he's got good size. And really the only thing keeping him from being a great player right now would be Chris Carson in front of him, like you said, has been doing so well there. But even if Chris Carson holds on to that job, and, and I think by the end of the year uh, that we think that he's going to unseat Chris Carson and become the starting back by the end of the year. But even if he does, and just the fact that Mike Davis is gone, those stats are going to go to him. I think it easily hit. Even with Chris Carson being the starter, I think Penny could easily get 800 yards rushing, eight touchdowns, 
and maybe 25 to 30 catches. Uh, this guy's got a lot of talent. I think he's a guy that you got to have on your roster. Obviously, he's, he's, he's not a guy that you're going to depend on as being a starter at this point. Absolutely. One thing that helps him is he's the young guy, right? He's young. As much as coaches want to just play who's ever most talented, it's always really tempting to put the younger guy in there and try to build him up for the future. So I think that bodes well for him as well. All right, here we have it. Adrian Peterson, seemingly the running back that just does not age. This guy had a huge season last year. He totaled over 1,200 total yards and eight touchdowns when you combine his rushing and receiving. That's pretty good. In fact, he did it. What really impresses me is behind pretty awful offensive line that finished 24th in the NFL as far as their run block rating goes. Pro Football Focus gave them a 53.7 rating. That is brutal. Um, but of course, it gets a lot better than that as far as Peterson goes, his numbers and what he was able to do despite that. He still got it, man. 4.2 yards per carry, 45 avoided tackles. That was tied for first in the NFL, by the way. Not only that, but the physicality is still there. 75% of his rushing yards last season came after contact. That is insane. I don't know how he is able to do it, but age has not affected this guy. He is a standard league stud who scored 13th, or excuse me, finished 13th in fantasy points per snap and 16th in total fantasy points among running backs in standard leagues last season. I think Adrian Peterson is a guy who's got to fit in this spot simply by what he did last year. And, and of course, with the young quarterback and the new quarterback coming in, they've got Case Keenum and they've got uh, uh, Dwayne Haskins, excuse me. I think it's definitely a situation where they're going to, again, lean on the running game. And I think that's going to help them quite a bit. But the passing game is going to be improved this year simply by the fact that they're going to have an actual quarterback in there. and They're not going to be bouncing around from injured quarterback to injured quarterback. And so I think that he could have a good year this year as they lean on him again. I wouldn't be surprised if he went out and had another 900 to 1,000 rushing yards. Of course, he's getting older, and that's a major concern. But we'll talk about the other concern, Darius Geis, later on in this video. Yeah, you talked about how bad the old line was last year. They were bad, but a lot of that was due to injuries, and they're healthy again. So that offensive line is not bad. They were bad because they lost starter after starter upon starter. They were really a patchwork mess uh, going on there, but they should be healthy this year. So number 34, we've got Tariq Cohen. He saw an increase in production from his rookie season. He improved his yards per carry, his rushing, rushing and receiving yards, his touchdowns, his catches. He's a great fit for Coach Nagy's offense. He really is. He's a great weapon there. Uh, he has solid PPR value. He ended up 11th among running backs in PPR scoring last year, but he has a very limited ceiling due to his size. He's 5'6", 181, uh, a small back there. He's never going to be a true three down back. I think he's going to have a very similar career like Darren Sproles has had. If you want to know what he's going to be like, what to expect, kind of where his ceiling's at, look at Darren Sproles' numbers. That's what you can expect from him there. What you see is what you get. I think he's a running back two slash three in PPR leagues based on league size. All right, here we have Darius Geis. Now, of course, he's returning from injury. In fact, he missed OTAs, but is fully participating in training camp. So that's good to know he has completely recovered from his injury. In fact, he said, I'm ready for football, man. It's been a long year for me. In fact, he said it's been the longest year of his life. He went on and continued to say, being back out there with the guys, I couldn't be out there for OTs, OTAs, and that killed me. But now it's training camp, and we are getting ready for full pads soon. I'm ready to go. It's exciting, and it's been a long year. I love this guy. He's one of those guys that just loves football, and I think that bodes really well for him. Now, uh, he's a guy who last year before his injury, according to ADP, was a top 20 fantasy running back. But that's not the case, and I don't think we even agree with that last year. Uh, but before you completely discard this guy, note that there's definitely some upside with him. I think really one sentence can really capsulate this guy. Do not trust him as anything more than a risky running back for. That's right where he fits. He's a guy who's got the upside, but you just can't trust him at all, especially with Peterson in that offense. He's a guy you stash on your bench and you hope for, especially in dynasty and keeper leagues, but that's really it. And that's where this guy fits. We haven't seen anything from in the NFL, so there's nothing else for me more to say. I think this is a pretty simple guy to talk about. Leave a comment if you have any more questions. Number 36, Austin Eckler. I think a lot of people are going to think, why is this guy not rated higher? We'll get into that a little bit here. Austin Eckler last year had a good year. He had a 23rd in PPR scoring among running backs. He increased his rushing, receiving yards, TDs, and catches. His yards after contact were solid as a rookie at 3.11. Last year became a very good 3.44 yards uh, after contact there. He was eighth in elusive rating last year. He has a career yards per carry of 5.3. And another thing that's really looking good for him is the 
threatened holdout by Gordon at this point. Melvin Gordon saying he's going to hold out. We don't know how long that's going to be for. Uh, according to ESPN's Adam Schefter today, he came out and said there's mounting pesticism that Melvin Gordon's going to be in camp anytime in the near future. So everything's looking more and more like Austin Eckler could become the guy there. Um, this could become the James Conner situation where you draft this guy uh, as a stopgap until he reports to camp, right? And you saw how that worked out. James Conner was phenomenal. Le'Veon Bell never reported there. So why don't I rank this guy higher? Here's why. One, I think Gordon is going to report. I think it didn't work out too well for Le'Veon Bell. I think that um, Melvin Gordon will report to camp before season starts. Two, um, when Austin Eckler had an opportunity to fill in as a starter last year with Gordon down, he didn't have the same success that Gordon had. He struggled as a starting back there. If you look at the games where he had double-digit carries, where he's given an opportunity to really run that ball, his yards per carry dropped to 3.79. Not very good there. I think he's a guy that you've got to consider. I think he's got good upside, especially if Gordon holds out. And I think if Gordon holds out as we get closer to the end of August there when a lot of drafts are taking place, you're going to see Austin Eckler's average draft position go up there. And if you own Gordon, you got to handcuff him with Austin Eckler at this point. Once again, I think right now things are trending upwards for this guy. Uh, another concern I have, another reason why I don't have him as high, is Jackson. Uh, another running back they have in that team last year that had some success filling in there. But I do like Austin Eckler. Uh, for me, he's not a, a running back one, two. Uh, you know, he's kind of that, that bubble three, four range there based on the potential of Gordon holding out. I completely agree. This is an absolute must handcuff. I think one of the best ways to measure Latavius Murray's value is to look at what Mark Ingram did. Now, Mark Ingram over the last three seasons in New, in New Orleans had 29 touchdowns. That's just shy of 10 touchdowns a year. And he also went out and he had 5.3 yards per carry and an average of 52 receptions a year. That's what he did the last three seasons playing for the Saints. That's a lot there to deal with. That is a huge kind of role coming in for Latavius Murray. However, there's some things to know. One, Latavius Murray is not the same talented running back. Where Ingram averaged 5.3 yards per carry, Latavius Murray averaged just 4.1 over the same span. Um, so while I think there's a huge, huge room there for him to capitalize on that situation, I, I don't think Latavius Murray is going to take full advantage of it. The other thing to note is that his carries, his receptions, his touchdowns, all of that from Mark Ingram dropped last season, and that's because it's really Alvin Kamara's offense. He really, really last year absolutely, without a doubt, secured himself as the running back in that offense, and the fact that they let Mark Ingram go proves that even more. Latavius Murray is a solid secondary running back for the Saints. In fact, a lot of teams would love to have Murray as their backup, um, however, fantasy-wise, we've got to keep him here because I don't think that he's, he struggles with his yards per carry. I don't think he's an amazing option. But there is one good piece of evidence, one thing that suggests maybe he does what Mark Ingram did. However, again, I don't think so. And that is he had 28 touchdowns over the last three seasons with the Vikings. That is only one less than Latavius Murray, or excuse me, Mark Ingram did over the same span. I'm not expecting the same production, but there's room for him to grow. And I think as long as he can produce, he's going to find the end zone. Royce Freeman, well, we did a video called Bold Predictions. In that video, we went and said by the end of the season, Royce Freeman is going to be the starting running back and he'll have more rushing yards than Philip Lindsay. I stick by that. I think that's still going to happen. Um, and with Lindsay, it's not a matter of talent. We think he's very talented, but you talked about it. it's a matter of size. He's just not big enough to handle that wear and tear in the NFL. Um, every once in a while, a guy can come in and do it for a while, but even injuries catch up. But even Jamal Charles, who was undersized, we saw that it caught up to him at times there. And if you look at uh, Philip Lindsay, I think some of his success was a bit exaggerated. He only faced loaded boxes 14% of the time. They were often playing from behind, so a lot of his carries were against teams that were in pass defense, and he was able to exploit that space. Very perfect setting for his like skill set. Um, so I think that Philip Lindsay, a very good back, but I think uh, maybe people are overstating his success a little bit there. Um, if you look at size, Royce Freeman's a 230-pound back. He's the ideal back in the NFL. He can become an every-down back. He can become a bell cow for that team if need be. And at times he's shown promise and shows he could be your typical running back that you want to have there. And if you look at the metrics, he didn't perform as bad as a lot of people realize. His elusive rating was 20th in the NFL. Now, 20th is not great, but it's not bad at all. Um, that 20th in the NFL and his elusive rating actually put him ahead of running backs like Gurley and Kamara and way ahead of Lindsay in that category. He faced the second most loaded box in the NFL, um, Freeman did. 36% of the time he faced loaded boxes compared to only 14% for Lindsay. He was 14th in yards after contact at 3.22. Very good. That's ahead of running backs like Gurley, Ezekiel Elliott, Adrian Peterson, Christian McCaffrey. I could go on and on. 
I think Fremo is really hurt by bad quarterback play. They're often playing from behind, made it hard to stick to the run. His, four, um, his 4.0 yards per carry is not great, but it's decent. And then in week 17 last year when Lindsey was out, Freeman had an opportunity to play there as a starting back. He had eight catches. I think that bodes well. It shows that one, he's not going to be a better pass catching back, I think, than Lindsey, but I think he's going to not be a vulnerability in that passing game there. So uh, he's a guy that I like a lot there. I think there's been more and more talk coming out of Broncos camps that they're going to have a split role. They're going to increase the carries for Royce Freeman. I think he'll take advantage of it. I think he's a guy that you can't trust starting the year, but I think he's a guy you got to have on your bench. And I think as the year goes on, his carries will increase. All right, guys, that is it for our Tier 4. Now we're moving on to our Tier 5, our running backs 39 through 50. We're really starting to get deep now. And I'll tell you now, we're really starting to get into a place where these guys aren't looking amazing. There's certainly things to talk about. They certainly have some fantasy value. You need to, absolutely need to have a deep bench. Of all those guys that we've been talking about over the first video and so far this video, you have to understand that a lot of those guys are going to get hurt. Some of those guys are going to get suspended. Some of those guys are going to lose carries because they're not quite producing as well as we expected, whatever it may be. You still need to pay attention to these guys, but they just don't have nearly the value as some of those guys in the top 20, those guys in the top 30. Um, but anyways, here they are. Here's basically our last 11 guys. Boom, right here we have running back Ido Smith. There's not a lot to talk about this guy. This guy showed some talent. In, in a five-game stretch, he ran for four touchdowns, and he really started to kind of get some, some looks from people. People really starting to consider, could this guy be a great fantasy option? Then Tevin Coleman leaves, and that suddenly bumps him up to the number two running back in that offense now that Coleman's gone. And I think there's a lot of good news surrounding him. However, the production wasn't there. He found some touchdowns, I think really because of how good that offense was around him. You know, Matt Ryan and Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley, all those weapons push the ball down to the one yard line and give him a carry. Great, he's got a touchdown. But was he a good running back? Uh, well, his 3.5 yards per carry last season would suggest no. It's also important to remember he is behind really a jack of all trades, a guy who used to be the number one, I believe it was 2016, Freeman was the number one fantasy running back in the NFL, or 2015, excuse me. Whichever one of those years, it was just a while ago, Freeman was really absolutely insane. He can do it in the running game. He can do it in the passing game. Ido Smith has a huge value boost if Freeman gets hurt. But as long as Freeman is healthy, this is exactly where Smith belongs. Dale Henderson. Okay, so for me, I'm not going to get into, uh, I'm huge on this guy, blah, blah, blah. Here's what he did in college. For me, it's simply an issue of Gurley's knee issues and who's the next man up in that prolific offense. It could be Malcolm Brown, right? Um, but to me, he's looked more and more like a journeyman in the league. I think last year is his best year that he had there, but hasn't really proven, I think, to be that go-to guy. Kelly was disappointing last year. So right now, my money's on Henderson. If something happens with Todd Gurley's knee and he can't play, watch how camp develops there. We'll look at the depth chart, see who kind of Thrushes that out and becomes the number two guy there. But you look at C.J. Anderson in that offense last year. C.J. got cut by Carolina. Um, they cut this guy. He goes there and he was phenomenal down the stretch. Just shows you what you can do when you're in the right offense there. He's a must handcuff if you have Todd Gurley. If you look at Henderson. He's a big play, uh, big play threat there. I think he's a good fit for the Rams offense. If we look at their inside-outside zone schemes, things like that. I think he also affords Sean McVay some wildcat options. So uh, here's a guy for me that... Really, it's where he landed. He's in a great position. I think he's probably the next man up if something were to happen to Todd Gurley and that knee injury flares up or becomes more permanent. So that's why I've got him there, simply because where he's at and the team that he's on. All right, so here we have Ronald Jones Jr. Man, his 1.7 yards per carry last year was pretty embarrassing, but that was really a product of a terrible offensive line that ranked 28th in the NFL as far as run blocking goes. I'm not going to talk a lot about this guy, but what I do like is that he's a young running back who was drafted last year to be the starter, and I still think he could be. They brought in coach, new head coach now, Bruce Arians, who's really just a guru with running backs. In fact, Bruce Arians was the head coach back when David Johnson had 19 touchdowns, 80 receptions, and was the number number one fantasy running back that season. Maybe he could work some of that same magic with Ronald Jones Jr. Of course, not to the same extent. And I think there's going to be a lot that needs to happen in the years to come before he could get that far. Uh, but coaching staff is really a huge improvement for him. Ronald Jones Jr. is a guy who you could definitely take a risk on. Deion Lewis. Deion Lewis last year finished 28th in PPR scoring among running backs. I think that's going to continue this year. Derrick Henry is horrible in the passing game. He doesn't have good hands. they got to have a back that can come on the backfield and catch that ball. He's going to be the guy. And he's shown he can do it many years. In 2015, 
He was actually on pace for 82 catches before getting hurt. Last year, he finished with 59 catches. And before last year, he actually proved to be a very productive runner. Before last year, he never had a yards per carry under 4.4. Now, this team is committed to get Derrick Henry carries on first and second down. But I think Deion Lewis is going to have some nice plays as a, a flex play in PPR leagues based on matchups from week to week. Not a guy that you're going to roll every week, but definitely time that he's going to be able to plug in your lineup as a plug and play and be very effective for you. All right, Peyton Barber. Really, guys, the only reason we put him here on this list is because last year he had uh, totaled over 800 yards and five touchdowns. However, his yards per carry was bad. As I talked about earlier, I think that Ronald Stone Jr. is the future running back in that offense, and he was drafted last year for a reason. Um, 3.7 yards per carry. I think the thing that hurts him most was that he finished ninth in attempts, but outside of the top 20 in both rushing touchdowns and rushing yards. I just don't think that Peyton Barber has a whole lot of value. But if you're going to go out and get Ronald Jones Jr., maybe you handcuff him with Peyton Barber and you get whichever guy is starting that week or whichever guy is the hot hand. Donta Foreman there. Uh, this guy was really starting to look good, uh, get comfortable in the NFL before he has Achilles injury. He's a big physical back at six foot two thirty five, and his final game before he got injured that year, he was having a huge game. He had 10 carries, 65 yards, two touchdowns. He had three catches for 15 yards. If you watched 2017 and looked at the team and you watched uh, Miller and Foreman, Foreman was by far the more effective explosive back compared to Miller. Now, Miller recovered a little bit last year, but if you looked at it, before last year, Miller had a four-year consecutive decline there. Now, it looked like he recovered a little bit, but if you look at some metrics, it would seem to indicate that maybe Miller didn't have that great of a year more than the offense around him improved, like you kind of touched on that point. Hopkins, Watson, their success kind of really spilled over into Miller there. He was 29th in elusive rating. That's not great. I think there's a little bit of an open door there. Foreman can come back and show what he did before the injury there. He's a guy that has sleeper appeal for me. He's got good upside. He's a great stash. Now, as of July 26, I would say he's a running back four, a guy that you can't trust to start, but he could be a steal that you have on your bench. All right, so here we've got Naheem Hines. A lot of people don't know, he actually started his college career as a wide receiver before moving to running back to fulfill some team needs and because they were noticing he's actually pretty physical for a wide receiver. And of course, that made itself extremely evident in the NFL. Many people are already rating him as one of the running backs in the NFL with the best hands, one of the best pass catching running backs in the NFL. And why not? The guy as a rookie comes out last year, has 61 catches, over 400 receiving yards and four touchdowns this guy skyrockets up our rankings when we go talk about PPR specifically however this is not a PPR specific league so we've got to keep him here because that is Marlon Mack's offense and he just didn't get quite as much touches as much carrying as much time as we need him to get to put him higher on this list and also he's a little bit small for a running back so we don't expect that that is going to change Samuels. Everybody knew when he came in the league he'd have good uh, good hands. He'd be good in passing situations there. They even talked about him being a tight end. Um, but he also ran very good last year in that. He had a 4.6 yards per carry. He had a three-game stretch when James Conner was out. He had 223 rushing yards on 42 carries for a 5.3 yards per carry. Very good. There's been a lot of talk this year that the Steelers will have uh, two formation sets. They might have both backs in there. They're going to add more carries to him. Um, undoubtedly, this is James Conner's team. I believe that James Conner, I think, is a better back. I think he's going to start as a back and have a good year there. But remember, James Conner's only had one year that he's been successful, so he's far from a proven lock. So for me, Sam is another guy that you put on your bench, and he's a great stash with huge upside. Mike Davis actually had a pretty impressive year last year when you consider he was a third string running back. Then suddenly you look at his 728 all-purpose yards and realize that's actually pretty good. His uh, career best 4.6 yards per carry. He started to get some things done last season there in Seattle. No wonder that Chicago Bears picked him up this year. However, this guy's going to be way low down on this list. He's not a guy that looks like he could be a phenomenal guy who's a third down running or a three down running back excuse me who's getting it done who's a workhorse back and there's just so many options there Cohen is there and David Montgomery is there we just got to keep this guy along this list because it really seems to be a running back by committee offense and if it's not it's not going to be him him at the head of the helm excuse me 
Matt Breda. Uh, so Tevin Coleman's poised to lead that team in carries. He's the bigger back. I think he's going to be their go-to guy there. But Matt Breda's success is hard to ignore there. Uh, he's a smaller back, but he runs really hard. Um, he's very dynamic. He has a hard time, hard time staying healthy there. He had moderate success. They brought in Jarek McKinnon to be their guy. Jarek McKinnon goes down. He takes over, and he really shined not only in the regular season, but in the preseason. He had a 5.3 yards per carry once again. Uh, this is Tevin Coleman's team, but Matt Breda did too much last year. He was too dynamic on the field to ignore, so I think he's a guy that you're going to want to put on your bench. It's about your 4-5 running back that's going to sit on your bench just in case. All right, here we have Miles Sanders, an Eagles running back right here. This guy's worth the spot on your roster just to see what he might be able to do. For starters, we talk about um, Jordan Howard is there, and he kind of seems to be the guy. Who knows? There's definitely room for another running back, and maybe Sanders is that guy. Coach Peterson came out and said, he says, we definitely have to get him in the mix early, and he says, I'm excited to see what he can do. His mental reps and what he's done on, the, on film talking about X's and O's has been very impressive, and they want to slowly work him into the lineup and see what he can do on game day. I think that's really great praise from a running from a coach to a running back who's not really projected to be a number one. That's about it, to be the number one guy. That's really about as good a news as you can get. So finally, rounding this out, Carlos Hyde. I love Damian Williams. I think he's poised to have a great year. But Damian Williams has never been a start-to-finish starting running back on any team where he started and finished the whole year there. He's always been really a journeyman until last year at the end when this guy had a phenomenal finish. Meaning, all it takes is an injury or any struggles, and it puts Hyde in line to get carries and arguably the best offense in football. You've got to have this guy on your bench just because if something happens, Damian Williams or he struggles, Carlos Hyde could be huge, and he's a guy that's been in the league for a few years, and he's proven that he can be successful. So, um, once again, I love Damian Williams. I think he's going to have a great year. I don't suspect he's going to get hurt, but just in case, that's why you got a guy like Carlos Hyde on your bench. You just never know. All it takes is that one rude twist, torn ACL, and you've got yourself a top 20 running back.